Hi, in this video, we want to take a look at imputing missing values in R. Okay, so the idea here is that I want to make a predictive model and I have my data, but there are some omissions in the data set. So I have, and we call these missing values because the value is missing. All right, so what do I do? So the classical statistics way is to say, hey, we just throw out anything that doesn't have a complete observation. Just get rid of it. Don't worry about it. Just throw it out. And that makes sense. And like, you know, when you have like smaller data sets and um, missing values are like re really aren't much of a, an impact on what's going on, it makes sense to just throw them out. And that, that is always an option that we have. But in a lot of situations, especially in predictive modeling and machine learning, it's just not good practice. And the reason for that is if I'm, if we have something called missing at random and I have a lot of like columns in my data set and I only accept complete observations, I can lose a lot of data off of that, which is just not good. We don't want to lose our data unnecessarily. So what we want to do, we want to come up with some system that comes up with basically surrogate values to plug in and uh, that way we can get a better overall predictive model. Okay, so first thing I want to say is that we only impute predictor variables or more specifically, I'll let me back that up. I'm going to weaken that statement a little bit. We only impute uh, non-target variables. So we never impute target variables do not impute target variables unless we have very little training data with the target variable or the target variable is also acts as a predictor on another variable such as in the situation where we're dealing with um, market basket analysis or graphical models so there it's a little bit more complicated in this video i'm focusing on supervised learning where we only have one target variable or possibly just a few target variables working with us okay so there are tons of packages in R to deal with this or you know you can do this in base R. There, there's lots of ways to tackle this. Some good package for imputing and dealing with missing values in R is MISMDA, MICE, CARAT, and uh, NANER. I will say that. I think NA stands for the not available missing value. And so some things that we, first of all, we want to consider, so just some you know, good rules of thumb. Uh, anytime that a predictor has a large percentage of missing values, consider not using it. Uh, so whenever I don't know like what a good cutoff is or a good standard or a good parameter, I find that enterprise minor is a good uh, way to kind of get like a, a, a benchmark value for what should be tried. Enterprise minor ki kicks out any variable that has uh, less than 50% of non-missing values. So, you know, 50% is a good reasonable one to go with. It depends on your project, honestly, it depends on the other data sets. You know, it, it depends on a lot of things. Um, remember, whenever we're doing machine learning, whenever we're doing model building, it really is a, a series of subjective decisions and you have to just kind of make decisions and, and decide and do what's, what you consider best in the moment. Now, something that I will strongly stress to you, keep the missing value patterns. I haven't talked about missing value patterns yet, but I'm about to. Even if you get rid of a predictor variable, strongly consider keeping its missing value pattern. Keep that in your mind. Now, if you're gonna be using a method that involves random numbers, set the seed first, just best. I didn't do that in this example. Uh, just because I'm just running through an example, but you should. All right, now if, if data is coming from a symmetric population and I'm going to be imputing with sample mean, uh, I mean, that, that, that's a reasonable way to go if you want to impute with a constant, but if the data is skewed, the median or the mode are better choices. And right, replacing missing values with a measure of some constant such as mean, median, mode, maximum, minimum, mid-range, something like that. This is These are very fast imputation techniques. They're straightforward, but they can significantly impact the variable's distribution. Use caution when using central tendency imputation or, or constant value imputation is a better way to word it. Uh, 
really you only want to use constant value imputation when the num when the percentage of missing values is relatively small. So it, it really won't have much of an impact. Uh, but if it's better to do that than to just throw out data, honestly, in most situations. Now, something you also need to consider if I'm doing something on if I'm working on a project that involves a lot of hypothesis testing, imputing could be you know received very poorly by the, the people who are accepting your results. Why? Because it looks like you're making fake data. Because you know what? When you impute with missing values, you are making you are making fake data. I mean, that's literally what you're doing. So just watch out for it. Uh, you know, whenever you work on a project, consider the audience, consider who's going to be looking at it. Uh, that's, you know, number one most important thing. In predictive analytics, the only thing we care about is a crystal ball. We care about, is, does this give me a good idea of what will happen in the future? Nobody cares about how you get there. So don't worry about it. if I'm doing hypothesis testing, they're going to be a lot more nitpicky about things. And so there I would not be doing imputation. Now, something to think about, if I, let's say I've got a binary uh, variable, you know, I've got it with zeros and ones, and I impute, let's say with one half, the mid range. Okay, well, or some other value. I can look at that as, you know, the estimated likelihood of the value being one. All right, and so that's the way to go. Now, if I have uh, you know, some other like range values and I, I put it in, I can, you know, it's, uh, these are just like some estimated values. Now, something that we also need to watch out for is that if I have a bounded region, let's say like a binary predictor that's between zero and one, when I impute, plenty of methods may give me something greater than one or less than zero. So just watch out for that. Uh, that might not be an issue in what you're doing. That might be a, a huge problem. It depends on what's going on. Uh, my advice to you is, you know, in those situations on those columns, just replace things greater than one with one, things less than zero with zero. That. Uh, similar things can happen. Let's say if I had, uh, you know, some patient data and, you know, I start imputing, you could get something weird like, you know, a pregnant male or, a, you know, a, a male that's had, uh, you know, a positive number of you know select successful deliveries of babies you know like, like stuff that just doesn't make sense and that's something that we always need to watch out for all right so now sources of missing value so how do we get here well we could have data collection errors you know that could happen like um it was supposed to be written down it didn't happen or it wasn't recorded uh, by some omission, maybe there was a mistake, maybe it just wasn't possible. Maybe, it, you know, what we, our data collection method just didn't apply to all the cases we would run into. Um, maybe a, you know, a subject didn't even respond to like the survey or the quiz or something like that. Uh, we can have incomplete responses or like where someone uh, fills out like a survey, but just kind of stops halfway through and hands you the, the survey and walks away. Uh, so then like, what do you do? Do you want to throw out that data? Maybe, maybe not. You have to decide. Uh, there's system failures. So, like, let's say you have a you know a device that's recording, you know, the re the output of stuff, and it just fails on you. All right, you get the missing value. Measurement failures. So this would be a failure of the device itself that does the measurements. And there's also changes in the data over time. So what could happen? This is especially true with uh, you know things involving humans and governments and stuff like that. If I was working with like census data. And let's say this, this round of the census does not include a question, or there's a new question that was on previous census uh, you know, questionnaires, then when I look at those, that individual question, then I'm going to have missing values if I look over time. What do you do about it? You know, it, that's a very good question. All right, so something to consider, models that have linear structure, such as linear regression, neural networks, they, so these are ones that involve like matrix calculations, they, like matrix algebra to be able to compute. And so really a neural network is actually, believe it or not, under the hood, like a, either a linear model or generalized linear model. Just It's like a, a tangled bag of linear models. And what it does, it omits observations with one or more missing values. Okay, well, what this can do, this can throw out a ton, a ton of data. You know, especially if I have a lot of columns. So rejecting anything that has an incomplete, you know, uh, record, it, it can, you know, really bias my results and make it so that it only works on the complete cases. 
And so I will be, you know, making a bad model, even though I think I'm doing good. So what we want to do, we want to figure out some surrogate system to fill in the blanks. And then, you know, we're, you know, we're going to make the, the, the best surrogates I can get and then build my model, you know, going forward. Now, there's some stuff that we have to do whenever we do this. We have to make assumptions about the nature of the missing values and other package, uh, you know, the mice package and the Nanir package, they do a very good job of helping us try to figure out what's going on with our data. We're not going to really touch on that here, though. All right, so let's go ahead and load the data. So we're going to do an example. I'm going to use the Nashville housing data set for home prices, Nashville home prices. And what I'm doing here, I'm using read R to read in. And so something that is kind of important about the read R suite of functions is that you have to, if, if you want to run fast, you have to specify what type of data you have in each column. N is numeric, C is character, capital D is date. And here uh, it'll load in everything pretty fast for us. And the very first column has uh, a missing column name. So that's, that's why I get this one. Now, when you work in R, because it's open source, in a lot of ways there are inconsistencies between packages. And it, you, know, you can start running into problems. One of the major problems you'll run into is if you do not have syntactically correct names on your column names, you can have problems. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna go ahead and use the make names function to make my column name syntactically correct. Now, if I look at that, I notice that I've got like consecutive dots in there and it just kind of gets unwieldy on the names. It's longer than I want uh, and it gets kind of hard on the eyes. So all of this does, I'm using the G sub function to replace the dots with spaces, get rid of consecutive spaces and then replace the spaces with dots. Kind of a long way to go about it, but this cleans it up nicely. And now here, I'm getting rid of some columns that are not useful because he, these, uh, you know, the X1 and the unnamed are not useful. X1 was the, uh, like the bad column name. And then the state, we're talking about Nashville. Everybody's in Tennessee, right? I mean, it, it'd be different if it was a town that was on like a, a state border, but everybody's in Tennessee. Let's just leave it as is. All right. So, one thing that we're going to be doing as we work through this is one of the principles that we like to do that we, we consider best practice is that when I fill in the missing values, I fill in the columns that have fewer missing values first. And then I work progressively to the columns that have more missing values. Why do I do that? Well, it sets it up so that it's like I'm, in, I'm, I'm hoping to incorporate like less bias as I do this because I'm running the risk of having bad surrogate data as I go through. And there might be like correlation aspects I'm not anticipating of what's going on. So to help protect myself, I'm trying to set it up so that the columns with very few missing values are imputed. And if I do a poor job there, it's not really that big of a deal, honestly. Uh, if there's only like one or two missing values and when I have a huge data set, a lot of observations. But as I get to like greater and greater percentage of missing values, then it becomes more of something to worry about. And by arranging my columns in the order of missing values, what this does, this enables me to kind of like look and see, like if I see, oh, there's a problem with a column that's on the far right as I work through, that, that's in, I know that it had a lot of missing values when I started out. I know just, just get rid of it, just, just toss it out, chuck it in the bin. All right, so here I'm actually sorting everything, sorting the columns by the class. So remember we have, uh, we have character, we have date, and we have numeric. So then it's sorted that way. Now I'm gonna go through and I'm sorting the rows by the number of missing values. So I'm using the apply function. I'm taking my data set. Now the margin is one. one it goes with rows, two goes with columns. Remember, rows before columns, that comes up over and over in mathematics and, and, and statistics everywhere. It's always rows before columns and because of how we represent the dimensions of a matrix. 
So margin one, I'm going through and I'm figuring out the number of missing values in each row. And then I'm sorting, oops, I'm using the order function to sort all of the rows by the number of missing values. So what's gonna happen is that row one is gonna have few, if any, missing values, while row, well, the last row will have the most missing values in the entire data set. And so this will let me know, once again, if I start having, if I start seeing problems with the lower rows in my data set, I know, hey, it had a lot of missing values. I should probably throw that out. So I'm going to be mindful of. And then I'm sorting the columns in the same manner. This, this time I'm using S apply instead of the apply function. It's faster, but it wants to work on columns and not on rows. So I did not use it in the previous one. Okay, so now let's go ahead and just take a look at the data. Let's see what we got. And I'm not going full blown into this, you know, because I want to keep the, the video relatively short. So I'm going to take the uh, table. I'm just going to look at the class. So once again, I'm using S apply to get the class of each column, okay? And I can see we got 16 character, one date, 11 numeric, okay? And so something that's important to be mindful of is each type of data has different concerns when I do uh, predictive modeling and different concerns when I do imputation. So, you know, we have different techniques for data prep. And we need, you know, I, I like to actually group my variables, group my columns by their data type. That helps me keep track of what, um, you know, what I should do when I should do it. Now, I only do that when I have smaller data sets because it can take, because like short, sorting out the columns can take a long time and can like just waste my time if I'm just trying to do that. But with a smaller data set, I do this to keep organized. And now let's go ahead and look at the number of missing values by row. All right, so we can see that we have two observations that have no missing values. Okay, so I want to point that out. There are two rows that's in this entire data set with no missing values. Hmm. Okay, so if I was to throw out any observation that has one or more missing values, I would have two rows of data left. No, it's not, it's not, that's not going to work. That's just not going to work. So, but as I look through, I think there's like 29 columns or something like that. I can see that there are 157 rows that have exactly 21 missing values. That's a lot, you know, when there's 29 total, uh, you know, columns. So, but now the 157 I know are towards the bottom and you know, if I, if I want to take a look at them and find them, it'll be easy and I'll be able to, I, you know, I can just get rid of them if I want to, which is, would not be a bad idea in this situation. And here we can look at the number of missing values by the column. So when it comes to columns, there are seven columns that have no missing values. There are two that have 159, eight that have 30,619, there's one with this amount. And you know, you can notice that we have relatively similar numbers in this range. So it's something to notice right there. Now these are all, you know, considering the number of rows, these are all relatively close to each other. And then we have one column that is missing, you know, over 50,000, which is almost the entire, uh, you know, number of rows. So that is something that I might want to throw it out. I'm not throwing out any, any of them here uh, for this video. I'm just pro progressing as is, just to kind of show you the missing value imputation part, filling in the, the, filling in the blanks. All right, now, something that is important is something called missing value patterns. Now, I think that this is actually more important than, miss, than filling in the missing values themselves. What is a missing value pattern? What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna create a column that records the information about the missing values of that row of data. Okay, so, so the most common way to do this is what I call unique. Here, I create a binary vector for each column that gets imputed. And then, 
so in the missing value pattern, I have a one if the if the entry was missing and zero if it wasn't. All right, so now why do I do this? Well, by doing this, what's going to end up happening is that this kind of like records, hey, that value over there, that was filled in. And so hopefully if there is bias in my imputation method, I hope that this uh, missing value pattern will counteract that if I include it as a predictor variable. This is a very good idea to do. Now, if I have a lot of columns, having a missing value pattern for each column with imputation can greatly increase the number of columns I have. That can be a lot. This may not be what I exactly want. So what I can do instead for each row, I can count the number of missing values and then record that. And that will be my missing value. So in this situation, let's say I have a hundred columns that get imputed. This situation, I will potentially have a hundred missing value patterns. I mean, you know, that's, that's quite a bit that, that can increase, you know, it potentially can double the number of columns that we have depending on our project that might be good, that might be bad. Count, what this does, you know, this creates an integer vector of just one to record all the aspects of the missing values. Now, I feel like when you do the unique one, what you should do, you should remove redundant vectors, which is definitely a good idea uh, in, in the situation. What you're going to find out in a lot of situations, and it's, it's true in this data set, that the missing value patterns repeat themselves across columns. Okay, so what, so the, for me, this has been a, this has showed me like there were like subpopulations or uh, data collection groups, data, data collection sessions that had consistent missing value patterns. And the missing value pattern to, you know, told me, hey, this group of data corresponds to this session of recording data, or, uh, of, rec of recording our, the observations. So I like to have the unique ones in there. Now, uh, but make sure you remove redundant vectors. Now, another option is just to go with a single binary vector that indicates that if there is one or more missing values, it's a one. If there's no missing values at all, it's a zero. That works. And then we could just omit the whole missing value pattern aspect altogether. I feel that in most situations, you want to include a missing value pattern for predictive analytics. But if you have issues with the ratio of observations to predictors, it definitely would be reasonable to not do it. All right, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the data and then for each column, I'm going to create a binary vector of zeros and ones one means it was missing, zero means it's not. And then I'm going to make that into a data frame. And I'm going to call that MVP. Remember that's missing value pattern. That's not most valuable player. All right, so one thing that'll happen is it's possible I have an entire column of missing values, or I have an entire column with no missing values. For the purpose of missing value patterns, that's not going to be useful. The constant vector is not useful for us in this in predictive analytics. So we want to get rid of those. So here what I'm doing is I'm getting rid or I'm finding all the columns that have constant zero or one and then I'm getting rid of it. Right. And this in statement will be a logical true false. So if it's in zero and one I'll get true and then here the negation switches it and then passing that into the index tells R to get rid of the columns that have that whose missing value patterns are all zeros or all ones. All right now at this point I've got a, you know about 29 columns for my missing value pattern. Now some of them repeat each other. So to get rid of them what I did was I took the transpose or to get the redundance take the transpose Take the unique values, take the transpose again. All right, so unique removes redundant rows. 
what I did, I made the rows and the columns, columns into rows on this transpose statement. Then I got rid of redundant rows on the transpose version, and then I switched it back. All right. Now, one thing about this, when you do your missing value patterns, I like to know which column it originally came from. And I have not found a good way to handle this in R. Honestly, in R, I have not found a good way to handle missing value patterns. It, it, it's a shortcoming. This is one of the huge advantages of Enterprise Miner. Okay, but what this for loop does, this goes through and it, uh, it finds all of the missing value patterns and it, uh, it matches them up to the unique missing value pattern data set. And if they match, it, it sets it up so that the column name includes the, uh, the, uh, the original predictor. All right, so when this is all done, and you notice it, it uh, tacks on MVP on there, so that way I remember it's a missing value pattern. So here, the very first one, property address and property city, the first missing value pattern corresponds to both of those. So every single time that I see property address is missing and I see property city is missing, they're missing at the same time. They have perfect correlation with each other. Hmm. That might be something that might be useful in figuring out how did I get missing values. Now, I don't know the history of this data set, don't know much about it, don't really care, but that's something you know, that if I want to dig in, this could be useful to figure it out. Now, address, city, tax district, acreage, neighborhood, land value, building value, and total value all have the same missing value pattern. All right, image has, the same, is, has its own missing value pattern. Owner name has its own missing value pattern. Full bath, finished area, each have their own missing value patterns. Exterior wall, grade, and year built are all, uh, all share a missing value pattern. And then foundation type, bedrooms, half bath, suite condo, all have their own missing value patterns. Okay, so that, that's something just to be mindful of. All right, so now let's take a look at the dimensions of what's going on. So the original data set has 29 uh, columns, if I remember correctly. If I look at the dimensions of all the missing value patterns that are not constant, that's 21 non-constant columns. After I remove the unique one, or I remove the redundant columns, I see that there's only 11 distinct patterns. Okay, so if I had concerns about the ratio between number of observations and number of predictors, I would rather use 11 than 21. Okay, now on this next step, one thing I like to do, I like to try and visualize the missing values in my data set. And I do that with a scatter plot corresponding to the rows and columns inside the data. All of this is just basically formatting the data into a long format. And what this scatter plot does is that this is looking, it puts a dot whenever I have a missing value. And it, if it's zero, it's a non-missing value. If it's a one, it's a missing value. And it puts a dot every single time that there's a missing value in there. And this is the first column in the data. You can see there aren't very many. This is the second column, third column, fourth column, fifth, and so on. Now, the rows are reversed from how we normally look at it. The rows, the first row is down here, second row, third row, fourth row. And remember, when we look at a data frame, first row is normally at the top, second row is at the top, the last row is at the bottom. Here, it's flipped, but you know, it's not too big of a deal. So I can just see that, like in this format, as I have it arranged, the missing values to a large extent, it's like there's two like major groups. Like I have a grouping of these guys that have all but one non-missing non value columns. And then here, there's only like one column that's not really missing much data. 
so I suspect that there's probably like, you know, some, you know, there, there was something systematic that resulted in these missing value patterns going on. And so it might be that these were like two completely separate data sets. And then someone went, hey, let's put these together because they're data. They, they should, we should be able to get them, you know, to work together. Well, I can see that there is something going on, something, something, something's there. Uh, there are, you know, well, I, I view it that there's probably two, two maybe more distinct populations in here. But for the purpose of machine learning, uh, it doesn't really matter. I'm just going to progress. All right. So now I've got my data. And before I get going further, I wanted to get like a little bit more prepped up before I do my imputation. I want some things to happen. I want to get rid of columns that have zero variance. I want to get rid of columns that nearly have zero variance. I want to get rid of columns that are, are collinear or highly correlated together. I'm going to center and scale my data. And then I'm going to do transforms uh, to, uh, to make it a little bit closer to the normal distribution. All right, so all my predictors, I'm removing the low variance columns. I'm removing columns that are highly correlated together so that if there's a strong correlation between a couple of them, the, the care package will automatically get rid of the one of like all but one of the group that's correlated. I'm going to go ahead and center and scale. Now for data exploration, when I'm building my models, I almost always center and scale my data. Why do I do that? Well, it helps prevent outliers from pulling a lot. It makes it easier to spot outliers. It, uh, it, it's easier to, you know, to spot variance inflation factor when everything has the same standard deviation. Uh, you can, you'll notice that if I center and scale my data and I do logistic, excuse me, if I do uh, multiple linear regression, you'll notice that the standard error of the coefficients tends to be close to constant as long as I don't have a variance inflation factor going on. And so by doing this, this helps me like identify problems that might be going on in my model. Now here, I'm using these to try and get my predictor variables to be, you know, to have a better distribution to be able to, for, to, to work for the modeling. Now, before the video, I took a look and I saw that sale price looks skewed to the right and it's financial data it's money data and so i probably want to change it transform this with the log i took a look yes i want to transform this with the log this with the log transform so my target variable is not the sales price it's the log of the sales price and when i say log that's base e so any predictions i make i need to convert with the exponential function and this gives uh, some warnings just because, uh, I mean, frankly, I'm going through to remove pro problematic columns. So I'm not too worried about this one. All right, now, when I use the, uh, the caret package preprocess function, which is one of my favorite data prep functions, it, it does not actually re return a data set to me. What it does, it returns a function. This is important. It returns a function that prepares the data for me. All right, so after I get that, after I get that function, I need to use the predict function on the function that was built and the data set that I want processed. All right, this is a very important step in, in predictive analytics. Okay, so in real life, I have model, I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna build a model on some data. And then at some point I get new data I need to make a prediction on. And then after that, I get new data again, I get new data again. Each time I go through this, I need to make a prediction. This structure of storing a function that I, I drop into the predict function will make it so that I can quickly and easily score the new data and make the predictions I need to do. This is a very important point in predictive analytics. All right, and on this step, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and I'm going to get rid of 
anything that has a, so I'm, I'm looking at the length of the unique values. So I, what I'm worried about here is a situation such as like ID variables or something that's nearly an ID variable for the data set. If I have too many levels of a categorical variable, it like modeling just isn't going to work. And so I need to do something about it. So I'm just throwing out those vectors for now. Other videos, I'll talk about other techniques to handle this, but for now I'm just getting rid of it. Also, if it only has one level, I'm getting rid of it. And then anything, so any of the columns that are in the names of the, you know, many levels categorical data or just one distinct level, I'm throwing it out. And then here I'm going through and I'm replacing the categorical data that has two levels with a numeric binary vector. Because in general, most functions in R operate faster with binary vectors than they do with categorical or factors. All right, so now let's go ahead and you know start building some models. So what I'm gonna do on these examples, I'm going to impute the missing values, and then I'm going to build a regression model. And let's see how good of a regression model I get. That, that way I can you know, compare like apples to apples. So the only thing that's different is my method of imputation on each of these examples that I run through. So on this first one, let's not do any imputation at all. Let's just drop it in there. Let's see what we get. So there's no imputation. Oh, and something I do, very consistently in this process is that I convert the category, right before doing the predictions, I uh, convert categorical data to their, the target variable conditional average. This is called categorical smoothing. The reason why I do this is that it's a lot faster in almost all situations. Uh, there is some information loss, but I feel like this is a good way to go for a lot of situations. In another video, I'll talk about categorical data prep. But I'm doing the same thing over and over and over. All right, so if I don't do any imputation at all, you can see that I'm getting a whole bunch of warnings. I'm getting a whole bunch of you know, problems off of this, a lot of errors. And when the caret package gives me my linear model, you notice that it can't even give me the R squares. Like it can't at all whatsoever. So uh, that's kind of discouraging. Now let's go through and let's talk about replacing missing values with a constant. So if I've got numeric variables, I can you know just select a constant value either for each column, I can plug in like the mean, either standardized, uh, or excuse me, the standard mean, regular mean, the trimmed or the Windsored mean, you know, median. I feel like the median is the best way to go if you're going to be using a constant. The reason why is that if the data is symmetric, the mean is better, but if it's symmetric, the mean and median are close. So you might as well just go with the median. And if it's not symmetric, the median is a better choice. So if it's not the best choice, the median is going to be close if you're going to be using a constant on numeric data. Now, you can also do mode, maximum, minimum, and mid-range. These make sense in time series a lot of times. So like if I was doing something that involves like, you know, the, you know, the hottest or the coldest, you know, if, if I'm doing something that involves extreme values, and that's what my data set is, kind of like with a stock market, the highs and lows of the day, and for some reason I had missing values, you know, maximums, minimums, and mid-ranges are definitely like good ways to go. Now for categorical data, some, you know, some options we can go with is most frequent, least frequent, maybe some constant value that we think, you know, is a good choice. Or, and this one is the one that I prefer to do, is I like to create a missing data level whenever I have missing values on categorical data. My preference, I feel like it's the best way to go. A downside to that is that this will make the missing level redundant with the missing value pattern. 
disadvantage, but I think it's worth it overall. So now let's go ahead and do this. So in here I go through and I replace missing values with the mean if it's numeric. I replace missing values with the most common value. So I'm using the table function. And then I'm sorting the table. Oh, and so here I'm sorting from least to greatest and I'm putting in the least frequent. And then here on this step, I am replacing categorical data with their uh, conditional average of the target variable. And then I go through and I build my linear regression model using the train function from the caret package. Let's see. All right, I get an R squared of 0.49. All right, that's not really great, right? But better than what I had before. Before, I didn't even have an R squared. What about my MAE? MAE was 0.6. Here, MAE is 0.4. All right, so that's an improvement, right? So just by putting in the dumbest way of doing imputation, I've improved my model. All right, so now let's do the same thing, but this time I'm using the median. And I'm going to plug in like unknown or missing whenever I have missing values for categorical data. Okay. And here I'm doing the same thing of categorical smoothing. Let's see what happens. Okay, so my R squared is 0.49 and my MAE is 0.4. So 0 0.5, 0 0.4. And yeah, they're like right on close to each other. I have it rounding off so I, it's not like, you know, hurting the eyes to look at the numbers. Uh, but there's probably a little bit of a difference, but they're practically the same. Now, another technique for imputation is what's called distribution based imputation. And what this does is it looks at the distribution of the non missing values. And it basically just randomly uh, plugs in a value that's from that distribution. And that, that seems reasonable. And if you look at the output of your predictor variables, it'll look a lot better. But, you know, so if, if the true correct value was large, but that random number just happened to be small, or the true value is small and the random number generator gave you something large, then you're going in the opposite direction you're supposed to be going in. So I don't like this. This to me, this is like serving the diagnostics, not serving the purpose of predictions. So I prefer something that is a central tendency measurement. But if you do the central a central tendency measurement such as mean or median, mode, mid range, uh, and then you look at the distribution pre imputation and post imputation, you will see a difference for. Uh, data that has uh, more missing values. All right, this next one is one that I use a lot at work. I feel that it is a good choice in a lot of situations. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take principal component analysis. So remember that principal component analysis is basically summarizing numeric data with a limited number of vectors. So remember, a mean is a summary of a data vector with one value. Well, if I take principal component analysis from one point of view, it is, it is summarizing an entire data set with like one, two, or three, something like that, vectors. So, which is a huge reduction, right? Well, what this technique does for imputation, it goes through, it computes principal component analysis, and then it makes predictions on a predictor column. And then it uses those predictions to fill in the missing values. So first round, it goes through and it replaces missing values with the mean of, of the column. Then it computes principal components. Then it replaces the, the, the missing values. So the ones that currently have the mean in there, it replaces those values with regression using principal components. Okay, and then it repeats two and three over and over and over until it converges or 
it reaches the criteria at the stop. Okay, and I feel like this is a very good way to go in most situations. But downside is that this only handles numeric data. One thing that you will discover as you work through, we really don't have a lot of tools for categorical imputation. Uh, every, like everything that works out like quickly and efficiently and effectively tends to be more geared towards the numeric data. All right, so here I'm going through and I am just imputing the numeric columns with principal components. Now here what I'm gonna do, I'm just slapping in unknown for the levels that are, have missing values on the categorical data. I do that just because it's fast, it's quick, it's easy, and I'm lazy. And then I am doing categorical smoothing just to get the, uh, the computations to be fast and efficient. And then let's see what happens. All right, so now my R squared, all right, so was what, 0.49 with a constant, now it's 0.47, a little bit of loss, not huge, a little bit, you know, 0.49, yeah, you know, we could do better. So it didn't work out on this data set, but I feel like this is a good way to go in a lot of cases. Now, the MIS MDA package, which gave us the uh, principal component analysis way of imputation, it has some other ways to go about uh, imputation. Here are the options that it gives. Um, the factor analysis way is probably the best way to handle categorical data, but I find that it takes a long time to run and it's just, you know, since there are other options out there, I feel like it's not worth doing. Just my opinion. So I personally have, I've played around with it. I've never seriously used it. Uh, the main drawback that I have found is that it just takes too long for what I'm doing. I don't have time to dilly dally waiting for the factor analysis to run. Now, the next thing to talk about is model imputation. All right, so here's the idea that I take all of my predictor variables and then I take a column that has missing values. I pull out that one. I'm gonna treat this as a target variable. All the other predictor variables, I'm gonna build a model to predict that column, the one I wanna impute. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to fill in all the missing values and then I go back and then I put this back in and I repeat the process over and over and over until there are no missing values. Now, this is why I like to sort my columns by the number of missing values so that it's easier to identify which ones have a lot of missing, which ones don't. All right, so there are a lot of ways to go about doing this. Oh, something I need to say, something that is important. If I do model imputation, when I do my predictive modeling, I do not use the same structure. So if I use K nearest neighbors to impute, I do not use K nearest neighbors to predict. If I use linear regression to predict, or excuse me, if I use regression to impute, I do not use regression to predict. If I use a neural network to impute, I do not use an, a neural network to predict. I keep it, to ha I make sure I have a different model structure. Why do I do this? This avoids the echo chamber effect. So what can happen, and the best way to describe this is with regression. All right, if I take two columns and then I impute using regression between the two, the correlation is going to increase. And so that's going, that can create like an echo chamber effect. It, it will, it can increase the collinearity. So when I did the PCA, do you notice that PCA technique that was in the previous example, that was actually using regression in there. It looks funny. It's a different view on regression, but ultimately that is a regression model. So because of that, if I do PCA imputation, I cannot use a regression model when I go through and do my predictions. Watch out for that. So model imputation with a linear regression or other types of model, but regression is the uh, most well understood. This is going to reduce the variability in the imputed column and will inflate the correlation between predictors. Watch out for that.
All right, so here what I'm going to do, I'm going to use bag impute. So this is like tree-based imputation. This is a good way to go. I've had success with this one. Uh, the carrot package has three ways to do imputation. First one is median. Second one is uh, bag imputation, tree imputation. And the third one is K nearest neighbors. So the median one, I mean, that's pretty standard. You know, it's just a constant. It has all the disadvantages of a constant. The bag one, the tree imputation I've had success with. The K nearest neighbors uh, for the computation time, I find it's just not worth it considering you know, that bag imputation is just, so, just as easy to use. So I find that the K nearest neighbors just takes too long to run and frankly doesn't give better results than bag imputation. Just my personal experience. If you see something different, you know, let me know. All right, so now let's go ahead and see what do I get? All right, so with bag imputation, I can see that the R squared improved a little bit. MAE is not really moving in the way I would like it to. Okay. Now the next one is tree imputation, but with a random forest. I'm going to use the ranger package to impute the missing values. There's a special package called Miss Ranger. It sounds like a beauty queen, right? Miss Ranger, you know, Miss America. All right. So Miss Ranger uses the Ranger package, which is uh, basically a Ranger, a random forest package to impute missing values. Now, we could use uh, the random forest package, which comes, which it's implemented in Miss Forest or we could use Miss Ranger for this. My personal experience is that the random forest package has more like functionality, more utility to it, but it's much, much slower. And then the Ranger package is much, much faster. So, but the Ranger package has like less utility, less analytics attached to it, but the speed, the speed is a huge difference. So. For my personal work, I prefer Ranger. Uh, when it comes to making predictions, my, my experience is it's about 50-50 on which one will be better, and you don't know until it's too late. So I just go with Ranger every time. All right, so here I'm going through and I'm using, you know, random force to impute the missing values. Do categorical smoothing again. And then I build my predictive model. Let's see our regression model. And here my R squared improved to 0.51. Hey, it's, that's the best one I've got so far. That's good. It's not a huge increase, but it's better than what I had when I didn't have any imputation at all, right? That's a big difference. Now the next one is the mice package. And this one is a big one in the R community. I personally don't use it, but if you start looking up imputation in R, this package is gonna come up and it's gonna be a heavy hitter. This is a huge package for the purpose of imputation in the R community. Uh, I think it's a, a good one, it has advantages, it has a ton of options, a ton of features it, to the point where it's too many, but it's definitely a good way to go. Uh, if you, you know, want to, you know, dig into missing values. And I'm using just the default setting on this. I go through and I use the mice function in the mice package. And I, to make it fast, I put M equals one. I could, you know, crank this up. I think the default is five. And there's a lot, there are a lot of parameters you can play with on this one. And then when I go through and get the output, in this particular example, the R squared didn't come out. And I can see that the MAE is 0.61. I think it's mainly because of M being so low, I probably, the default of five probably would have been a better choice, but it was taking a little bit of time on my computer. So I just dropped it down. To be able to actually use the data, you have to use the complete function. So what happens is I use mice on my data set. Now it doesn't actually impute the values for me. I have to pass 
the output from the mice function into complete, then it will give me a complete data set with no missing values. All right, so the winner in this one is the Ranger package that gave us the best results. It's not, you know, as good as we'd like it to be, R squared of 0.51, but that's much better than what we'd have if we just threw out the missing values, which is what linear regression would use. Now, if I worked on it and, and used multiple models, I would probably get something better. I could probably, I could improve this if I would spent more time on it, but here I only looked at imputation techniques. I didn't consider, you know, transforming the data. I didn't consider model or feature engineering or anything else like that. Well, that's all I've got for you. Take care and goodbye.